специальный военный операции. Russian army is committing barbaric actions. Today I'll be talking about Finland in the middle of a war uh, in Ukraine. So trying to give you an insight of what it looks like and what it feels like uh, to be a Finn. And I'll do it by giving you an introduction, three points uh, and a conclusion. And by way of introduction, it's always important to understand that uh, we have been intimately tied with Russia throughout our history. One of the reasons obviously being our geographic location. We have 1,340 kilometers of border with Russia. That's a little bit like taking the train from Sicily to Turin. Uh, and we also have been uh, a part of the Russian Empire from 1809 to 1917, an autonomous part, but nevertheless. In 1917, we gained our independence. And in 1939 to 1944, we fought a winter war and a war of continuation with uh, the Soviet Union. And when the Soviet Union collapsed uh, in 1991, we were basically able to do things that we were not able to do as an autonomous part of Russia or as an independent state uh, before the Soviet Union collapsed. So we've had a close coexistence and a close relationship with Russia with all of its complexities throughout our history. Now, my three points today is what are the lessons that we can draw from Finnish-Soviet relations during the Cold War? Number two, what are the lessons that we can draw from the post-Cold War period? And then number three, what are the possible lessons that we can draw from all of this to the war uh, in Ukraine? So here we go. Number one is the lessons from the Cold War. Now, one of the misconceptions that I've heard over and over again uh, in the international media and all the interviews that I've been able to give uh, is this notion of neutrality. First of all, that Finland would still be a neutral country. No, it is not. And that Finland's neutrality was somehow wanted and recognized during the Cold War. No, it wasn't. Finland was a neutral country during the Cold War next to the Soviet Union because of necessity. It wasn't because of ideology, say like in uh, Switzerland, or because of constitution, say like in in Ireland, or ideology, uh, like for instance in Sweden. We were neutral because we had to be neutral. And one of the terms that I often hear, and it does raise some of my hairs, is this notion of Finlandization as a possible solution for Ukraine. Let me be absolutely clear. Finlandization for a Finn is a very sore point. It's almost like an insult. And the reason is very simple. It's a term that was created in the 1960s by a German academic. And for us, Finlandization meant that we were not able to be the democratic state that we wanted to be. We were not able to do the democratic politics that we wanted to do. And we were not able to join the international institutions where we wanted to be. The examples that I give. Number one, democracy. We could not even publish in the 1970s Alexander Solichenichin's The Gulag Archipelago. It had to be published in Sweden. There was this sentiment of an impediment of freedom of speech. Secondly, the Soviets were meddling in our internal and domestic politics. So we had a president, President Urho Kekkonen, who sat there from 1956 to 1980. So we're talking the better part of 24 years. Why? Because it was believed that he was the only one who could guarantee peace with the Soviets. Very uncomfortable. And third example, we were not able to join the European Free Trade Association Agreement, EFTA, we had to do a special arrangement in the 1970s called FinEFTA. So for anyone to say that Finlandization, when you basically compromise and sacrifice your autonomy, your independence and your sovereignty and your democracy on the altar next to an autocratic uh, state is not a solution. It's not a solution for Ukraine. 
and not for anyone else for that matter. Finland always wanting to lean to the West, but we were not able to go the full way during the Cold War. So the lesson from the Cold War is do not appease unless you really, really have to. And I don't think Ukraine needs to appease at the moment. Second point today, what are then the lessons from the coast, uh, from the post uh, Cold War era? And here, uh, Finland took very quick decisions. The Cold War ended, we could argue, uh, in 1989 with the downfall of the Berlin Wall uh, and the independence movements of Central and Eastern European countries, but really with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. By the way, remember that when there is regime change in Russia, it doesn't always mean that you go immediately to the democratic leader. Quite the contrary, in 1991, it went to the hardliners before then Yeltsin uh, came in. But what did Finland do immediately after the Cold War? We joined the European Union and forged a very close partnership with NATO and made sure that our military services and our military expenditure actually didn't go down, but kept at the same level and we went on to, for instance, buy uh, over 60 F-18 fighter jets to make sure that our military, and in this particular case, Air Force, uh, is compatible with the United States. So though be, we believed in the end of history that a lot of countries, including Russia, would move in towards liberal democracy, social market economy and globalization, in other words, soft power, However, we still believe that hard power needed to be preserved and we did that uh, uh, right after the end of the uh, Cold War. Now, uh, we tried to bring Russia into the international community. And to be honest, you might say that the years from 1991 to 1999 under Yeltsin were very hectic and chaotic. And yes, there were hyper-capitalism, and yes, there was financial crisis, and yes, there were tremendous discrepancies between the rich and the poor. But that is quite often what happens when you have a disruption from a collective, uh, state-driven economy towards a free market capitalism. Then that ends up balancing itself uh, out. But what we did at the same time when we tried to nudge uh, Russia uh, towards Europe and the international community was also to make clear on which side of the fence we were. We were on the Western, the European side uh, of the fence. The third lesson then is to look at, okay, what should we think about the war in Ukraine and what have we learned subsequently from the situation. The first observation is to say that unfortunately, unfortunately, Russia hasn't changed. And here you have to understand that if you look at Russian leadership from the 1400s to 2022, so today, there has been only one short interim period where the Russian leader has been what I would call uh, a de Democrat with a small, small d, and that was Yeltsin, 1991-1999. Otherwise, the Russian leader has always been supreme. A czar, a leader of a communist party, or President Putin. And that means centralized, hierarchical leadership. Uh, now, what are the lessons that Finns have drawn from this war? I think that Finns at the moment are driven by what I call rational fear. So this fear that something horrible might happen to us as well. This is the reason that opinion polls on NATO membership in Finland have radically changed overnight. We used to be about 50% against NATO membership and 20% in favor. I hasten to add, I belong to the 20% ever since 1995. I think that's when we should have joined. But in a democracy, a minority rarely decides over a majority, so it wasn't possible. But now uh, we have 62% of the population in favor of NATO membership and 16 against. So the lessons that Finns have drawn 
from the war in Ukraine. It's very simple. Join NATO. Never be alone again like we were in World War II. And my argument is that the NATO train has left the station. We're on board and a Finnish application for full NATO membership is not days or weeks away, but it's months away. Fortunately, our military is very strong. It's one of the largest in Europe and it is one of the most NATO compatible uh, out of even the NATO member states themselves. So drawing number one, lessons from the Cold War, number two, lessons from the post-Cold War, and number three, lessons from the war right now, I would conclude the Finnish situation as the following. I think Vladimir Putin has actually paved the way for Finnish NATO membership. Number two, I think throughout our history we've been able to have a difficult but balanced relationship with Russia. During autonomy it was about building our culture, our language, our education system and our civilization. And by the way, first country in the world to give women the right to vote and stand in elections was by Finland during Russian autonomy. We learned from the period of independence that we can be and will be independent, but at times, I fully admit, we had to compromise. And number three, it's very important that when you exist next to a big superpower, that Russia, timing is of essence. So you need to know when you uh, push forward a declaration of independence. You need to know when you get a peace, as we did uh, after World War II. And you need to know when to file your application uh, for membership in the European Union or in NATO. My argument is that the world has permanently changed for a long time to come. And Finns are often cool, calm and collected. And that's why this time again, we will be taking the right decisions. The Russian army is committing barbaric action.